candidate for United States Senate, Ed Tarver. John, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning to the Coweta Democrats, and thank you for allowing me to participate in to join this meeting this morning. Uh, John, thank you for that summary, that excellent summary of a of, of part of my history. Uh, and, the, and the reason I want to thank John initially for that is because I believe that leadership is about experience. And uh, the one thing that I tell folks that I'm able to, to talk to you is that, that I'm the most experienced person on the ballot, even if you consider the person that Governor Kemp appointed to serve in that seat right now. Uh, in addition to my public service, uh, John's talked about the uh, our association in Leadership Georgia, where uh, I not only participated in the class, but was able to go through uh, the chairs and uh, became uh, selected as the first African-American uh, president of the Leadership Georgia in the history of the Leadership or Georgia organization. Uh, I've also served uh, my community here in Augusta. Uh, I was certainly very active in my local chamber of commerce and was uh, selected to be uh, chamber president, uh, having gone through the chairs in, in Augusta as well, uh, in addition to having served uh, several terms on the Georgia Chambers Board. Uh, I tell you that to, to just to emphasize the fact that, that, that I'm certainly business friendly. Uh, I have uh, served uh, on the board for two uh, community banks. I'm currently serving on the board of First Community Bank, which is a, a bank that uh, has uh, relationships in both Georgia and South Carolina. And uh, so I understand the impact that, uh, uh, and, and in addition to serving on the, uh, on the boards of the community banks, uh, I'm also a, a business owner myself. Uh, I have a, a small law practice with my law partner, Ed Enoch, and, uh, which I started after leaving the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, in uh, 2017. Uh, I think that uh, based upon uh, you know, my interaction with Georgia voters across the state, uh, it seems consistent, and it doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. Georgians aren't getting from Washington what we what we need, or what we expect, and uh, it's time for change. Uh, certainly, would like to focus on the issues that are affecting us. Many of those issues have been uh, enhanced or highlighted by the pandemic. Uh, I don't think any of us on the ballot who will be on the ballot on November the third expected that when we qualified that we would be in the midst of a pandemic, that we would be relegated to uh, reaching out and, and communicating, campaigning, uh, trying to persuade people using Zoom and telephone conference calls and, and snail mail. But that's what, uh, that's what we've been faced with. And I think uh, certainly my campaign has made some, some adjustments uh, and we're trying to be as flexible as we can so that we can rise to the challenge. Uh, so I, I really appreciate Appreciate your the opportunity to be with you this morning. Uh, I'm running for the new United States Senate because, uh, as I said, I'm I'm not satisfied with uh, the polarization, uh, the the inability to get it, get things accomplished uh, that that we see on a daily basis. Um, I have the support of uh, of of my family and uh, my wife is just kind of joined off to the side. Uh, uh, I'm trying to coax her to get on the screen to say hello, but she is a little reluctant right now. But uh, uh, we we are committed to Georgia, have been committed to Georgia for a long time, and uh, uh, I am from Georgia. My my uh, my uh, parents were born in a little community in Georgia, Blythe, Georgia, which is right outside of Augusta. And uh, part of what I tell folks is that one of the things that has drawn me most to public services, the experiences of my family. You know, my father uh, uh, had to drop out of high school and uh, he entered the, uh, the military. Uh, he was underage actually when he was able to, to get into the military. And the reason for doing that was that his father died uh, when he was a sophomore in high school, uh, leaving his family without a, so a safety net. And, uh, and so he joined the military to, to pro help provide for his, his mother and his sisters. And uh, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm always moved by the fact that uh, my grandfather, who, who became ill while working at what, one of the Kalen facilities in, in, uh, in Jefferson County, Louisville, Georgia, uh, became ill, uh, needed medical attention, 
And uh, the, the only solution available to him at that time was to throw him on the back of a truck and drive him to Augusta, the university hospital. And uh, obviously by the time he got there, uh, he, had, uh, he, had, he had died. Uh, and to think that today, uh, his grandson, who he never met, uh, is, is running for the U.S. Senate, and we're still facing the same problems with health care uh, that were faced back 80 years ago, uh, access to health care, access to adequate health care uh, in a timely fashion for people of the state of Georgia. So that, that's certainly an issue that's uh, extremely important to me and one that, that, that I'm committed to working on as we go forward. Uh, the other is, you know, quite naturally, my my uh, my professional role as a as an attorney, and also my experience having clerked with Judge Dudley Bowen uh, in the federal court, and then having served uh, the Department of Justice under the Obama administration, is certainly concerned about what's happening with our criminal justice system. Uh, uh, one of the things that we focused on as uh, during my time as U.S. Attorney was just. Uh, the, the the racial imbalance. If you go into a uh, prison system, and it doesn't matter whether it's at the state level or the federal level, uh, you find that you know 75 to 80 percent of the of the of the uh, people who are incarcerated are, are, are African Americans or or Hispanic or or some other race. And uh, I don't I don't believe I don't accept I don't embrace this notion that that people of color have a greater propensity to commit crimes. Uh, uh, I'm concerned about the studies that have come out of uh, places like the or organizations like the Brennan Institute that indicate that if you're if you're if you're uh, black or brown and, and you have an interaction with law enforcement, that if you're stopped, you, know, you have a greater uh, uh, it's a, there's a greater probability that you're going to be arrested, and if you're arrested, there's a greater probability that you're going to be convicted of some crime. And if you're convicted of some crime, uh, there's a greater probability that you're going to be sentenced to some lengthy term of incarceration. And uh, the, the fact that in 2020, uh, in this country, that we are, uh, we, we, we incarcerate uh, more of our citizens than any other country on the planet says a lot. Uh, I remember as, as a student growing up and going through the public school system, one of the things that we always learned in, in school was about the oppressive systems uh, that you would find if you went to China or if you went to Russia and how they would imprison people uh, without adequate justification. Well, it seems like we have, we have leapfrogged over them and uh, in, our, uh, in our efforts to provide a safe, uh, free society for all, uh, our solution is to, to uh, incarcerate uh, a lot of people, which is, which, is, which is what has happened. And so I, I would certainly like to continue some of the work that we started uh, during the Obama administration by looking at the uh, fair sentencing to make sure that, that uh, what happens in our court system is consistent nationwide, that if you get arrested for an offense in Georgia uh, or char a charge or arrested with an offense in California, that you can at least know that, that the, the punishment or what you face is going to be consistent nationwide. And then uh, we would we, not uh, 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 want to overlook the fact of what has been going on here over the past several months with the, pro, uh, the protests that stem from the uh, George Floyd uh, situation in Minnesota. Um, clearly, there needs to be some, some reform in terms of, of how we respond to situations like that. Uh, there needs to be a system in place where law enforcement who who engage in improper behavior, who use uh, or engage in excessive force on the citizens that they're supposed to be protecting and serving, uh, if they cross that line, that, that there there'd be a method by which they can be held accountable. Uh, uh, I am, I consider myself to be part of that community as a former prosecutor, uh, but, but I recognize that there are a few in every group uh, that, that who operate outside the lines and outside the, the guidelines that are provided for their service. So, I am not by any means anti-law enforcement. Uh, I, I do not support by any means this notion of defunding law enforcement and the notion that, that communities can survive without adequate law enforcement. But I do support uh, uh, holding those who, who, who engage in wrong, wrongdoing and wrong, wrongful behavior. I do uh, agree with uh, a system that will allow us to hold them accountable.
and, and I, that would be one of the things that I would embrace and uh, pursue uh, uh, as, as, US, as the U.S. Senator for Georgia. Uh, I want to, and, and John, you can help me with this, I, I wanted to leave some, some time available for question and answer. I was told uh, by my, my staff that I had about 10 or 15 minutes to, to, to talk to you. And uh, so I uh, uh, would like to, to hear from you in terms of what your expectations are for your next U.S. Senator. Uh, I believe in the, the democratic process. Uh, I believe that Georgians have the ability to make good decisions about those who, who are going to represent them. And, and, and I don't believe uh, that we should uh, allow the our electoral process to, to uh, be uh, reduced to a situation where a few party extremists are allowed to dictate to us who's going to represent us in, in, in Washington. And, and that's a, a major reason why I'm in this race. Uh, I went through the process with the Democratic Party of Georgia and with the DSCC, uh, where, whereby we were supposed to uh, be vetted uh, and that they were going to, to help us identify uh, a strong candidate to run in this race as a Democrat for Georgia. Uh, uh, that process deteriorated to, at the end of the day, uh, although there were, were three people initially identif identified, myself being one of those three people to, uh, to, to go through a, a second phase of the process, uh, they ended up selecting someone who didn't participate in the process at all. And it was based on the fact that, 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 that some party extremists thought that this person, even though they didn't uh, uh, feel it necessary to offer themselves to, to engage with the rest of us, would be a better candidate. So uh, I... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm very committed to taking my case to uh, the people of Georgia and allowing them to make that decision, which is ultimately the way our, si our, si our system is uh, designed. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to uh, allow you to review uh, my bio, my resume, my history and record of public service. And I would match that against anybody that's currently running for this office. And you'll see that uh, uh, I have a record. I have a record upon, upon which I can stand. Uh, I have uh, served uh, faithfully. Uh, in the, the state legislature. I've served faithfully in the Department of Justice as a member of the executive branch. And, and I've also served uh, faithfully as a part of the judicial branch, starting with my, my early service uh, as the, uh, the, the judicial law clerk for uh, the Augusta Division of the Southern District of Georgia. And, and, and I point out that uh, there have been a number of firsts in, in, uh, in uh, uh, my life. Uh, I was the first African American judicial law clerk in the in the Southern District of Georgia's uh, courts uh, history. Uh, I was the first uh, African American, uh, as I said, uh, chairman and, and president of uh, Leadership Georgia. I've been the first African American to serve as the uh, United States Attorney uh, for the Southern District of Georgia. And I don't say that to 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 to, to, to highlight the fact of my race. I say that to 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 to, to let you know that that I have a history of working with the people who are available to accomplish things on behalf of the community that I serve. And, and I'm not going to, to not help someone because they're, they're not African-American and I'm not more prone to, 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 to side with or, or agree with someone because they, they happen to look like me. Uh, I believe in, in, in following the law and, 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 and doing those things that are appropriate uh, to, to move our communities forward. Uh, uh, I believe I have a record of that in anyone who has worked with me, and I would encourage you to, to, uh, to speak with John as well. We'll, we'll know that uh, that's how I've lived my life and how I've patterned my, patterned my life. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over uh, back over to John. And uh, if you have questions, I'll be happy to, to answer any questions you may have. Very good. Thank, Thank you, Ed. And I will defer back to uh, the chair um, uh, who's... Um, who's on this call. And if we, if there's time to open it up for some Q and A, um, I'd like to do that at this time and I'll mute and let, um, and wait to hear. Yeah, so as, as Chuck mentioned, uh, he, he had to, to run um, because, uh, because of my position as third congressional district chair, I've, he's kind of asked me to, to be the acting chair for the rest of this meeting. Um, so, uh, yeah, no, let's open it up to, to questions and um, just due to my nature uh, of I'll start because I just have, uh, I have two, um, you know, so 
Mr. Tarver, you know, were you one of those, did you retire um, from your position or were you one of the, the many that U.S. attorneys that were released by the current administration? I was released, but I, but I, I will qualify that and tell you that, that after the election, uh, I had submitted uh, notice to the Department of Justice to, uh, to the Attorney General, U.S. Attorney General, that uh, I was, uh, had selected a date to leave office. And while I was preparing my exit, actually packing up my office, uh, I received a call, phone call one Friday night, Friday afternoon that says that, that indicated that the president wanted us out immediately. And so I, I was already headed that way. So technically I was, I was fired, but, but, but I was, I had, uh, a, 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 I won't say a foot, I had a leg out the door already. And, uh, uh, I just uh, didn't move fast enough. All right, and then just one one more quick one, and then I'll we'll open it up to everyone else. Um, what is what is your website so that people can donate? Uh, that wasn't one thing I, I heard, and, uh, and and I have that on my notes. Thank you, uh, uh, Jimmy. My my website is uh, tarverforsenate.com. Uh, www.tarverforsenate.com, and that's T-A-R-V-E-R, uh, and the the word F-O-R, not the not the number four. All right, does anyone else uh, have any questions for Mr. Tarver? Yes, Ms. Cindy, I think you were, were muted when you raised your hand. Hello, Mr. Tarver. Um, it seems, well, with this whole, what I'm, I guess what they're calling a jungle primary, complete mess anyway, um, some folks are pushing or are supporting Reverend Warnock. How do you differentiate from Reverend Warnock? What, well, what is the difference in your... As, 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 as to Reverend Warnock uh, uh, specifically, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll start by saying that, that I've only met War Reverend Warnock one time. Uh, one of the things that, that, that I did as part of my due diligence in deciding whether or not to run was that, that I, I talked to members of the party. I reached out to people who had been identified as potential candidates to, to have that discussion. And he was one of the, the people that I reached out to. And for whatever reason, uh, uh, we were not able to connect. I, I, did, I did reach out and talk to, reach out to his office several times and we were not able to speak. But the thing that I would point out the difference between me and Reverend Mornock is that he's never been, he's never served in an elective office. I've been elected by the people on three separate occasions. Um, to, to serve, I've served in the state legislature. Uh, not, not only have I served in the state legislature, uh, I have uh, quite a bit of extensive, extensive experience in the executive branch having served in the Department of Justice uh, as a U.S. Attorney. And, and, and I would say that, that during my time as U.S. Attorney uh, for Southern Georgia, uh, we were probably one of the more aggressive uh, departments of justice in the, probably the history of the department in terms of of how active we were, our activist nature in addressing issues that were of importance to people uh, at the time we were in office. And so we did a number of things. Uh, 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 one of the things that I'm most pleased about was our, our focus and emphasis on reducing the size of the uh, prison population, especially for nonviolent uh, offenders who could be monitored and supervised in ways other than confinement. And uh, we also were very actively engaged in uh, an outreach to the community so with, that we talked to them about the impact of, uh, of, of our tremendously large prison population and what was happening. Uh, I can remember one of the, the great, uh, what I would view as a success stories, having, spoke, uh, having had the opportunity to speak to the, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, the business community in Savannah as U.S. Attorney. And, and, and when I explained to them that and that with, with, without doing anything more, every year, uh, 6,000 uh, uh, convicted felons, prior felons, were being released back to Savannah uh, uh, every year. And that uh, we had a choice whether or not we would find a way for those to reenter society peacefully uh, or, or they were going to be left with the only option, to, and that is to return to the, the criminal behavior that got them convicted of the felonies initially. And, and, and we also uh, had an opportunity to, and, and this is probably digressing a little bit, but 
to 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 make them understand that uh, a, a, a tremendously large percentage of of those who are convicted and sent to prison uh, they 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 are they are parents, their fathers primarily, and they have they have child support obligations. They have uh, obligations to their to the mothers of their children. Uh, when they when they're released, they they immediately assume uh, obligations for providing for their health their health care and and for providing safe housing for where they're going to live and for feeding themselves. And and without the, if, if we take if we adopt a blanket process where we exclude anybody that has a fel a felony conviction from 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 being able to to work and and reenter society, then 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 that just perpetuates the situ system that we're in. But but back to your question, Cindy, uh, I just think that I am uh, the most qualified person on the ballot uh, who will be on the ballot in, in November. Uh, uh, when you add in the, the experience that I gained during my seven years as an artillery officer, where I not only uh, was responsible for leading men, uh, I was also uh, 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 the commander of a, an artillery, uh, we call it battery, but it's a company. Uh, you know, served in that capacity for, for 18 months where I actually was responsible for 135 men who, who reported to me and I led them for 18 months. Uh, I also, also served in my capacity as the intelligence officer for an artillery battalion. Uh, and, and I can say that if I had to pick a, a, a period in my life where, where I matured and I grew up the most and the fastest, it was during the seven years that I was on active duty because it was a, a time when where I had to learn to work with everybody. And I worked with people from all over the country and all over the world. Uh, I had people who I was responsible for who, who didn't look like me, who didn't come from Georgia. Uh, many of them were from other parts of the country. And, and uh, that was my challenge to, to, to learn how to lead and to, to, to gain and to build their trust so that they would be comfortable following me. Uh, to, to suggest to anybody that, that uh, uh, people will, will, will follow your leadership simply because you put on a gold bar or you put on your captain's bars and that they respect the rank, that's, that's, that's more pie in the sky. Uh, if people don't respect your leadership, if they don't believe that you're acting in their best interest, then, then they're not going to follow you. And uh, so I learned that uh, probably the most important thing I learned during my time in the, in the military. And I've tried to take what I've learned from the military and apply it to, to uh, my public service, my community service, and uh, my life since I've left the military. Um, uh, I have a question. Um, yes, ma'am. First of all, I, I really like what you've said so far. You just touched on really the question that I have as far as, I know one person can't change the world, but I'm glad to hear that you are committed to working for all people and representing all people because that's the biggest problem we have going on at the federal level is the division, the hate, them against us. And, you know, we have to bring this country back together. I feel that we're going backwards as far as racial issues are concerned. And I don't, we, I, I don't, we don't want to, I don't think our country, hopefully our country doesn't want to go back to that. So uh, we need people that are going to bring the country together again. We're all Americans. We all need to be treated as human beings. And it seems like you have vast you know, experience in so many areas, but really we need people that are gonna stand up against this hate, this division. And you know, it's, it's just sad to see where our country is going. Um, so uh, I like what you've said, and uh, I'm glad that you are committed to working together because if if you don't work together, then we're not going to accomplish anything. And that's what's going on right now. So uh, we need more people such as yourself in the Senate position. So thank you very much for coming out and sharing your platform with us. Thank you for your comments. Elsa, I think you had your hand up as well. My, my questions were answered and, and the former uh, uh, speaker said it all for me. I'm uh, all in. You're very convincing, Mr. Uh, Tarver, and thank you so much for coming. Uh, you've, you've informed us a lot, and uh, we're very proud to have you on the ballot. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you very much, and I certainly enjoyed being here with you this morning, and uh, uh, I look forward to, uh, I still hold out hope that uh, I'll have an opportunity to get out and to actually see people face-to-face, -face and uh, to one day 
uh, be able to shake some hands again and, and maybe even share a piece of fried chicken. Uh, this has been a, a very difficult uh, election process. Well, maybe the fried chicken isn't such a good idea, given the pounds I'm putting on at home. <laughs> you, you sound like my wife. <laughs> well, uh, Ed, speaking of which, is Carol uh, still in the room? She is. Carol, come around and say hello, please. <laughs> we won't bite. <laughs> <laughs> If I could add just a few things to you, Mr. Travis. Uh, thank you for your military service. Being a retired military officer myself, we need that experience of people that have served in the military to be in Congress so that they can have a well-balanced uh, look at what America needs. So thank you for your service. Thank you very much. But this is my wife, Carol. Uh, Carol's a uh, uh, a pediatrician here in, in uh, Augusta. Uh, she um, all her life has wanted to care for children and, and that's what she does every day. And Carol. one of the things that we've been navigating is that throughout the pandemic, she has uh, gotten up every day and gone to the hospital every day and uh, actually went to the hospital this morning to take care of some babies. Thank you, thank you. God bless you. <laughs>